Greetings and welcome to another edition of AUHSD Future Talks. I'm your host, Michael Matsuda, uh, the superintendent of the Anaheim Union High School District. And as our audience knows, uh, our audience, by the way, is 6,000 and growing uh, podcast listeners. We are dedicated to the future of education, and we've been so blessed to have many leaders across the spectrum of education, as well as business, nonprofit, higher ed. And now we are interviewing some of our very own brain trust internally. And I'd like to uh, introduce the assistant superintendent of the education division, Dr. Jaron Freed. Jaron, welcome to our show. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I appreciate uh, you having me on our, our EHZ Future Talks. I'm excited to be engaging in dialogue with you this morning. So let's take a few minutes just to talk about your driver and how did you end up in the AUHSD? You have quite a story. I do. Well, you know, first of all, again, thanks for having me. This is an exciting uh, opportunity to be a part of this dialogue and really just to continue to transform the world of, of teaching and learning right, and education, the way that we think about um, preparing our kids for life. Um, you know, for me, uh, this has always been my home. I was fortunate and blessed to have grown up in Anaheim. I was a student at uh, South Junior High and Catella High School. When I went to college uh, in San Diego, um, I always knew that I would come back home in some capacity. Uh, when I was in high school, you know, I was blessed. I was, a, I was an athlete. I was a good student. But I, I, for me, a driver has been, I, I saw at that time, and it, keep in mind, when I was in school, we didn't know a lot about um, students with disabilities. We didn't know a lot about special education at that time. And I had some friends on my football and wrestling team who were in the mild mod uh, classes, you know, RSP. And I saw the way some of my other friends were treating them, that they were less than because they were in these classes. And it always bothered me. And um, I got to know these these guys because they were on my teams and they were quite capable. They were very intelligent. They were very um, uh, capable of, of, of being like any other student in the school, but they weren't treated that way because they were in these special classes. Um, so for me, when I went to college, um, I knew that I wanted to be um, doing something with, with students who had disabilities or some types of challenges. So for me, when I became a teacher, I became a special education teacher, and that was a big driver for me. And of course, I just naturally progressed through the district because of my desire to make an impact, especially um, to serve the underrepresented or the often marginalized student groups. So that's kind of led me to the position that I'm in today. Yeah, you embody the fifth C, this compassion, this high level of empathy, and we always talk about um, emotional intelligence and connecting that to the development of a learning organization. Could you talk a little bit about how important that is in a large district like ours? It's a big cultural shift. It is. Well, you know, again, we're in the people business and at the, at the heart and the soul of what we need to do as an educational entity is, is, is keep that front and center. And as a learning organization, I um, mean, there's obviously five disciplines that we, we think about, but um, at the heart of it is, is making sure that we are thinking about not just what we are doing, but how we go about it. And when we go about it in a way where we're thinking about our teammates and our colleagues, and yes, on paper, there's always going to be a chain of command and there's always people with titles that are here or here, but a learning organization has to operate in a way where, we're, where we see each other as colleagues and as teammates in doing this work. Um, you know, I'm really proud in the ed division, you know, we have restructured the way that we um, really have approached our work over the, the last several years where we've been trying real hard to break down some of those barriers or traditional obstacles that you might see in a traditional school district. Uh, we're really trying to operate more entrepreneurially where we're, we're like a business in a way. Um, I think about our principal meetings that used to be this club for only the principals and the directors and cabinet members. Now it's not uncommon to have our curriculum specialists join us at the meeting or our family community engagement specialists join us at the meeting because we're all engaged in that work. And I think uh, that has actually opened up uh, many, many eyes and has allowed us to go deeper with supporting our families. Um, as we think about customer service, we think about that fifth C in EQ. Um, the fact that we're doing this from a very team oriented approach, I think is, is incredibly important, but also it's been very strategic because uh, as a former principal, you, you can't do it on your own. You're one person when you have a staff of potentially 80 to 100 teachers, another 30 to 40 classified staff, um, you need the entire village. And I think by, by shifting to this learning organization concept, to this team learning, revisiting the way we, we, we perceive our mental models, all those things have really helped um, to create this more unified and, and um, systemic approach to how we're teach, approaching teaching and learning and making an impact on our students. 
Jaron, you and I have had many conversations about the future of education, the future of work. And um, I think sadly, many of our educational colleagues uh, throughout the state or even throughout the country are sort of defaulting to what they know, the status quo after this pandemic, right? During this pandemic, after it. Why do you think it's so important to continue to move forward? And, and what does that mean? And again, connecting that forward movement to the importance of this learning organization. Yeah, and that's a great question, Mike. And I know we've talked about this a, a bunch. Um, you know, we've seen in this last year and a half, um, the, the global market, the world of work, the economies rapidly, rapidly change. We were seeing this happen prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic, unfortunately, just exacerbated and really elevated and, and, and sped up this whole process. And I think as a tr traditional schools, when we think about the purpose of a K-12 institution, traditionally, it was to prepare kids for college. But there was a disconnect because what is what is the purpose of college? You know, it's in theory to prepare kids for the world of work or for life. And, and we're seeing there is a great disconnect between our institution, the institution of higher ed and even the institution of, of the world of work. And I think through our, our Anaheim Innovative Mentoring Experience Program, our, we're fortunate and blessed of have now have like 90 corporate partners and nonprofit partners. We're seeing firsthand that if we continue to do what was, if we do what we've always done, we are doing our students and our community a, a tremendous disservice in really preparing our kids for what's ahead. And I think it's incumbent upon us, it's our moral imperative for us to really think differently about how we approach teaching and learning. And that's why for us, and this, and this connects to the learning, the learning organization and, and all those who are a part of it, it is all of our responsibility, starting with you as the superintendent and our board, right, setting the vision. And then from our assistant soups to our directors and, and other cabinet members, to our principals, our assistant principals, our teachers, our classified, our counselors, all of us to really shift our thinking and our approach uh, in terms of, of what we provide our students. Um, we're seeing, you know, firsthand jobs change. And the five C's, you know, the drivers for our district, really the career preparedness systems framework, uh, which incorporate three basic circles, three concepts, right? Student voice and purpose. Are we making sure that what we deliver with our students works for them? Is it, is it relevant? Is it meaningful? Are we activating and empowering our students so that way they are taking what they are learning, those skills, even the traditional content, and finding ways to apply it to whatever it is they're interested in doing? That's why civic engagement is so important. Then when you take the soft skills, that other circle, the five C's, EQ, you know, the world of work demands that their employees have those skills. And too often, we only focus on the hard skills, traditional content, certificates, and dual enrollment, where kids may have this knowledge, but they have no idea how to apply it, and they have no idea how to do it in a relevant and meaningful way. So that framework has really been an important piece as a part of our learning organization, so we can make sure that how we instruct, what we choose to instruct, is um, really meeting a, a larger and more important need for our kids. So we're closing the inequities that many of our students have faced, and we're providing them access to meaningful jobs in the future, meaningful and productive lives. And, and that's why if we don't make these changes, Mike, I mean, we're, we're, we're drastically going to create a, a negative impact for our kids where the world of work that change is changing before them, they're not going to be able to access. So what's, what's exciting about our model, I think, is that now we have longitudinal data and we're showing that it's not either or, that our, even though we're not teaching to the test, we do not use interim assessments or, or district benchmarks. We now have data, especially from our higher ed uh, pledge partners, UC Irvine and Cal State Fullerton. Could you share with the audience some of that data that, uh, that really demonstrates that our model is one that is working? Absolutely. Well, so first I'll start off with the traditional data, right? That, that, that will speak to other districts and families who may be watching this that want to know how we are doing in comparison to other districts. So if you look at traditional data, because of the drivers that we have, uh, we are seeing uh, tremendous outcomes. When you look at the Smarter Balance Assessment, right? That this is the, the, the federal test that we take as a, as a, as a school district that um, really measures literacy and numeracy. You know, despite, like you said, the fact that we don't do interim assessments, we're not teaching to the test, but because we're focused on the five C's and this, the CPSF framework, right, the, the student voice, the civic engagement, we're seeing our ELA scores 
rise, uh, despite the fact that we're not doing interim assessments. When you look at our college readiness indicators, you know, for California, we have the UC system and the Cal State systems that, that, that uses what they call an A through G uh, criteria, which are classes that students would take that are rigorous, that deem a student eligible or ready for college at the UC or Cal State. But this college and career indicator, you know, we have over the last several years surpassed districts like Newport Mesa, Placentia or Belinda, Fullerton Joint, where these districts traditionally have, have been outperforming us, but over the years we have not only caught, but now have surpassed them in terms of our college and, and career readiness numbers because of the work that we're doing. When you talk with our collaborative partners, and we're blessed to work with UC Irvine, Cal State Fullerton, and our local community college partners in, in Cypress and Fullerton College, if you look at how our students are performing as a cohort compared to students who come from other local districts in the county and throughout the state, we are outperforming them. The most recent data that we got from UC Irvine is, is persistent data. Our students who go to UC Irvine, they're persisting at a 94% rate, whereas um, students from other districts are persisting at a 91% rate. That's significant. And we attribute that to our drivers, the, the, the fact that we focus on teaching the traditional content. So I don't want people to think that we throw traditional content away, but we take that traditional content but how we teach that concept, uh, that, that concept and that, those concepts are through the five C's. It's not an either or. They're integrated into the way that we approach teaching and learning. And then when you add the civic engagement aspect, the activating civic voice and purpose, now students find ways to make that content relevant to them and how they can do good for the world. So we're seeing a tremendous, tremendous uh, increase in our traditional metrics. But then when you look at our non-traditional metrics, Right. We're working closely as an ed staff family and ed staff division to really identify those non-traditional metrics um, that really indicate our kids are, are doing uh, above and beyond work in terms of being ready for college, career and life. We're seeing this in, in the way that our students are advocating at city council meetings. We're seeing this in the way that our students are performing with their writing. If you talk to the UC and Cal State admissions teams, they'll tell you that the students who write personal narratives in our district are outperforming students who write those same narratives in other districts because of the writing that we do, because that's a form of communication, one of the five C's. So we're seeing this increase both in traditional and even non-traditional metrics that just indicate that we're we're moving in the right direction, that we're doing right morally by our students. So you said earlier that our district is transforming to more of an entrepreneurial culture. Could you uh, elaborate on what that means? Yeah, so I think for many districts, and again, I'm not going to call any districts out, but for many districts, uh, career technical education, um, you know, the world of work, that's something that's an add-on. That's something that's an after school, or maybe it's a vocational class for certain groups of students. In our district, uh, we see career technical education, the five C's, um, preparing kids for this mindset of entrepreneurialism as a central part of what we do in instruction. Um, you know, for us, we're building exclusive pathways at all of our schools. You know, we're blessed to have the first artificial intelligence pathway in, in, in the, probably in the county or the state. Uh, we have a biotechnology pathway. We have an iLab, an incubator lab that helps incubate and, and develop um, concepts and ideas where they can begin to monetize off those ideas in a, in a business-minded spirit, much like the world of work already has in place. We also have the state-of-the-art Cybersecurity Institute. So when you look at those four, but in addition to medical academies, um, law and legal academies, we are building these exclusive pathways that are preparing kids for that world of work. What's beautiful though, Mike, is as you know, the five C's, right? The communication, critical thinking, collaboration, um, creativity, and of course, compassion, they're all central to what we do instructionally. So even if a student is in the medical academy and decides to change their mind and then move towards a law and legal academy, nothing is harmed by that because the five C's are central to those aspects. You know, we're, we're building that spirit where our kids are prepared for the world of work. The other difference is with the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, we're, we're getting our kids to think about that fifth C in compassion. How can we approach whatever it is we want to do beyond high school and do it with the mindset of paying it forward, giving back. Creating creating a better world creating, through the unlimited you, which is our vision. Not just doing, exactly. Creating a better world through the unlimited you, exactly. So so for us, this has been an integral piece to how we've approached um, our work and the way that we approach instruction and the way that we've been building our schools. Uh, so that way all students, right, not just some students, but all students get access 
to these opportunities. They all get the access to, to think about the things they want to do to impact the world in a better way. And then they're empowered to do that when they leave us through civic engagement, through these pathways, and through just the traditional instruction that we bring to the classroom each and every day. You know, when I think of uh, entrepreneurial, I also think about creation and inventing things, right? And being nimble. Um, a lot of uh, folks, they, educational leaders sort of, uh, they, they get stuck in this, what we call the status quo, right? Whereas I think that we've been very nimble. Could you share, for example, the idea and the concept of dual enrollment and because you know a traditionalist might think well that's really going to be difficult because you're dealing with um, associations you're dealing with faculty senate at the community colleges and um, that's just too hard right well and i think we all know mike um, status quo is easy it's easy to just keep doing what we've always done but as a learning organization you know if you have your aspiration here you're constantly having to reflect What's your reality and how can we close those gaps so our reality becomes closer aligned to our aspiration? And going to your question about dual enrollment, you know, most districts, including our district, we have advanced placement classes. Nothing wrong with advanced placement. We have them. We have many kids who benefit from those courses. But as you know, for those students to earn college credit, it is they're only going to receive that credit if they pass that test. So as a teacher, by default, you're often going to teach towards that test, which doesn't necessarily allow for the five C's to be fully integrated into the classroom because there's a pressure to have kids pass that exam. Whereas in dual enrollment, it's based on passing the course, not a test. So the professors, the teachers, the instructors, they have far more greater flexibility to really teach in a relevant or meaningful way to engage our students so they can not only earn and learn the mastery of that content, but they can also earn that college credit simply by passing the course. Now for us, dual enrollment, as you know, with our college partners is something that's traditionally done after school. And we have that model in our district where students are able to take advantage of our partnership with Cypress and Fullerton College, taking these dual enrollment courses um, after school. But as we know, we have athletes in our district. We have kids who have to work after school or have to help take care of their family. So after school isn't necessarily the best option for some of our kids and some of our students. So we were thinking about, well, how can we bring dual enrollment as a part of our school day experience where um, we get kids these opportunities, but we don't do anything to jeopardize our already very strong relationship with our teacher unions and just our colleagues at the site themselves. So the idea became, well, how can we integrate dual enrollment into our school day where we could potentially use the, the, the professor teaching that dual enrollment to shift kids, let's say, in a senior, senior English class to where now they're taking a, an English course through dual enrollment to get both credit for college, but also for us, so they meet their graduation requirement. But now then take the teacher who is teaching our seniors and now give him or her the opportunity to teach maybe let's say freshmen, so we can help lower class sizes uh, with our freshmen, which we know that is the first point at, at which they enter high school. And we know that we really need to be strategic with how we support our freshmen and our ninth graders with English and with math as an example. So by integrating dual enrollment, we've intentionally and strategically have been able to take our existing staff. So there's no harm to our staff. We're not losing staff as a result, but we're, we're able to reallocate or repurpose our staff so we can lower class size, which is always a good thing, to be able to in, in meet the needs of our younger students while our older students get the experience of taking a college course taught by a college professor, but with the supports that, that our district and our local partners provide. So it's really been a win-win. It, it has, it has, but it's also in terms of these cutting air edge areas that you mentioned earlier, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, or biotech, it's been able, we've been able to expand our uh, sort of our curriculum through these types of partnerships. Could you explain how that works? Yeah, so I, I gave the example of English, but it's it's we're actually doing far more than the traditional English or even a math or a history course. We're able to connect our dual enrollment partners to our pathways that I had mentioned earlier. So, for example, if I'm a student at Magnolia High School's cybersecurity um, pathway, uh, not only am I taking courses that are integrated as a part of my school day experience at Magnolia, but I'm also able to take dual enrollment courses uh, with Cypress College, as an example, where now I'm getting certification. So when I graduate, Oh, in high school district in that, in that program, I'm not only getting the diploma from, from Anaheim Union and Magnolia High School, but I'm leaving with certification in cybersecurity in this example, or potentially a certification in biotechnology, or 
perhaps an advantage with artificial intelligence or the medical pathway. So now when I go into that industry, should I choose, I already have a leg up on my peers from other districts. And what we're also finding is some students, they're able to enter the, the world of work after high school if they choose. And because of the certification, they're landing jobs where we had a student at Magnolia who landed a job with Hulu. Right, this new, this new streaming device uh, in terms of how the world of cable is shifting, where he's making sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars straight out of high school, and then through our Anaheim Union Educational Pledge, you know, if he goes back to Cypress College or Fullerton College, Cal State Fullerton UCI, he can advance himself in that industry, and now he's making over six figures. So, so we're positioning our yeah. kids for that for that pathway. Yes, and in expanding our curriculum through these partnerships. Now, you had mentioned earlier that we're close to ninety business and nonprofit partners. And one of them happens to be a small little company called Google. Could you share with the audience how that happened and what that means for K-12 public education? Because that, so we are the first in the country to partner with Google. Yeah, so we are incredibly excited to be the first uh, public school across the country to have this partnership with Google where our students have the ability to earn Google certificates uh, as a part of their coursework. And going back to the integrated model, we're actually having teachers trained. I think we have almost almost 30 teachers now who are being trained in these Google certificates where they're finding ways to integrate these um, this course into their own existing course, where our students, when they finish our own course, they now have the ability to, to pass exams where they can also earn Google certification. Now, it's, 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 it's a, actually a fun story in terms of how this came to be. You know, you might think that we were reaching out to Google and we have been really proactive in trying to find these partners, but because of our drivers, because many other districts simply haven't made the position yet to their educational approach where they're really trying to meet the needs of our students in preparing for this world that's rapidly changing before our eyes, Google found out about the work that we're doing around the five C's, around our career preparedness systems framework. Uh, and as a result, they proactively reached out to us. Matter of fact, they reached out to your office wanting to meet with us and we, we were kind of shocked and didn't know what to expect. But as a result, we formed this beautiful partnership where now our students are getting access to these cert cert certificates one, for free of charge, and the two as not something that's in addition to, but something that's integrated into something they're already doing. So we've been empowering our teachers. And again, we thought initially we'd be super excited if we could get only 300 of our students to get this access in year one. We have over 1,000 students, 1,200, I believe, who are now getting this access to these certifications and certificates through this process only in the first, really the first few months. So really the, the potential is limitless in terms of what we could be doing with our students, for our students as we move forward. So incredibly exciting uh, that we're bringing this opportunity to our students here in the Anaheim Union High School District. You know, and I think Jaron, that's a huge example of being nimble, being entrepreneurial, taking advantage of an opportunity and creating this learning organization culture. I, um, in the last minute or so, that we have left, Jaron. Uh, we do have a number of students who listen to this, and um, what is your what is your advice to them, or maybe even parents from uh, of, of some of our students? Well, you know, for me, even as I think about my own kids, and I have a senior in high school, and I have a sophomore in high school. And my my simple advice to them is is actually rather simple. First, it's just to be kind, right? I, I want my kids to be kind, loving, and compassionate. You know, just just embracing that concept, our fifth C, they're already giving a tra trajectory that's going to lead them towards success. Two is you compete with yourself, right? You be the best version of yourself every day, right? If, if every day you make a, a, a commitment and a goal to be a little bit better than when than how you were the day before, that growth mindset, that 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 concept of personal mastery, which in a learning organization. Um, they're going to be well positioned to just navigate whatever the world throws at them, which we learned real quickly this past year. There's no blueprint for how to handle the pandemic, right? We were tested in our, our compassion and in our ability to, to think and be creative and to be critical thinkers right on the, on the cuff as we were faced in this, this encounter with this, this predicament, right? So I want my kids to be kind. I want them to be the best versions of themselves. And then two, I want them to be um, students who are, are driven to make an impact. Right. I want my kids and I want others to think about how can you make our world a better place? How can you leave the better world a better better place than it was uh, you know, as a result of the things that you're doing? I think if, if those become your personal drivers, 
you're going to you're going to be successful no matter what path you choose you're going to have sound and, and and positive relationships with no matter whoever you interact with right and and, and that's how i to me you live a, a happy life you know there's this there's a saying that I, I tell my kids that i that i remember reading years ago there was this there was this kid that was in elementary school who was asked a question you know what is what is your goal in life and the kid wrote down to be happy and the teacher went back to the kid and said, I think you misunderstood this assignment. You know, I'm thinking, what is it that you want to do for a living? What kind of job do you want? You know, like, I want to know what is your goal in life? What kind of job do you want? And then the student responded back to the teacher. No, I think you are misunderstanding what it is to be a, a, a person living, right? At the end of the day, if you live a happy life, I mean, what, what's, what's better than that? Um, you know, and, and that's a fulfilled life. So, so for me, that's been a big driver for me is, is it's not about what I do, it's how I do it. And am I really happy? And, and for me, I think that sense of belonging, that sense of being kind and compassionate and that sense of just, you know, I'm not worried about what someone else is doing. I'm worried about me being a better person. I think all those things combined, um, is a recipe, recipe for success, no matter what you, what path you choose. So that'd be the advice that I give to our students and our families. And I believe wholeheartedly that in the Anaheim Union High School District, we are committed to those ideals, which is why I love working with and for you, Mike, which is why I'm a, a deep believer in the work that we're doing as a district and why I'm committed uh, for the long haul. So uh, that, that's what I would say to that, that, that question. Wow. What a way to end the, the interview, Jaron. I, I uh, am so honored and blessed to be your colleague and uh, someone who's learned from you how to be kind, how to improve the world. And, uh, and make it a better place. So I'm, um, I'm glad to be uh, working on that goal with you, Jaron, as a colleague. So on behalf of our 30,000 students and their families, thank you so much, Dr. Freed, for this really amazing and informative interview. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it.